worked on a feature many, many years ago. We had an entire sequence that involved uh, a number of computer generated characters. It was absolutely an amazing, amazing outcome. And then we went to see the movie and we found about two thirds of everything that we had done in that sequence didn't make it into the final cut in the theater. Oh! It was a massive financial and time investment. And then it always comes down to the editor being like, nope. You're listening to the CG Spectrum Podcast. CG Spectrum College of Digital Art and Animation offers specialized career training for the film and game sector. Join our hosts, Career Development Manager Maxine Schnepp and CGS Mentor Justin Mullman as they chat with industry experts doing cutting edge work in film and games. Now, on to the show. So this week I'm talking to Sean Amliner. He's one of the CG Spectrum best and brightest. He's worked on so many of the projects that I geek out in as a kid. He's done Star Wars, he's done Star Trek, he's done Avengers, he's done Jungle Book, he's done Pixar. Sean also was a person that was in charge of this amazing worm commercial that we just got done making in-house. If you haven't had a chance to watch the worm commercial or the two behind the scenes, check those out first because we're going to talk about them at length. Sounds good. Spoiler alert. Everybody knows what an animator is when you're talking about it from outside the industry. Yeah. But when you talk about compositor, people are like, did you say composter? <laughs> Which, um, you know, if you put it into Microsoft Word or wherever, uh, it always wants to autocorrect to compost. Which, by the way, I love gardening. Yeah. It's the Greek word to mean to, to compost, <laughs> which is to blend. Images right. To right. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It's one of those, um, you know, I'm one of those people that actually sits in the credits after movies and shows just because, I don't know, I feel like it's relaxing. And you see compositor a lot. And you're right. When, when people think about like working in games or movies or visual effects or animation, they're always like, animation, Kurt. It's like, no, compositor yeah. is like you hit you hit it on the head. It's on it's in everything these days. You can't watch a commercial. Like we I, like we just mentioned you worked in the in Bridgerton. I would have never thought that compositing was on Bridgerton, but like when we think of visual effects, we're thinking of the ones that you like Star Trek and Star Wars and Avengers. Yeah. But it, it is used in every single like even the smaller shows and like the ones that you might not think are very uh VFX heavy, right? Absolutely. And you know what? Uh shows like Bridgerton and others, you know, it's it's it is effects heavy because it requires, you know, building out, for example, just talking in general terms, you know, if you're if you're building a, a show that's a period piece built in, let's say, the 1800s, well, those sets, they might shoot it in Europe, they might shoot it on location in what those realistic places would be, but they're wired for electricity, they have exit lights, they've got, you know, overhead power lines, yeah. that kind of thing. There's always stuff that has to be taken out on over to you know, w watch any just standard issue romantic comedy, even that we're going to touch because there's probably, you know, cell phones that, that the actors are holding. We're going to add the screens into the cell phones or, you know, all the, all the stuff that you don't think is there or that you would think is there is probably not. And we're the ones who would do it. So, so high level then a compositor is someone who's not only adding content like those screens that you said are possibly like signs, but you're also removing content. Um, so that way it, it is effectively more of like a period piece where the technology is not there or you're adding more content where like, you know, more of a sci-fi one, like uh, uh, Blade Runner or like Looper or whatnot, where you're adding content. Absolutely. So, you know, you see like an actor, maybe they're, they're, they're touching on some holographic heads up display doing this note kind of thing. Well, somebody had to add that CG stuff that looks like they're actually typing on a virtual floating holographic keyboard or computer screen or whatever. Yeah. Um, you just had me thinking about minority report right now. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. Compositors like touch that. Typing, these are super serious. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All that, all that yeah. comes from, I mean, that's going to be like what the iPad 2025. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that. Exactly. We can make that virtual right now. So, so when you're a, a compositor, then since you're, you know, actively like taking in or taking away and adding content, who uh, are typically, are you working with on your pipeline? Um, are you working hand in hand with specific asset creation or um, the actual raw film itself or what? So it would depend, but in general terms, it many times comes down to budget. It is. <laughs> it's everything. <laughs> yes. the, mo the money greases the wheels. The reality is depending on what that project's budget is, depends on whether it's just going to be exclusively compositors working on that project, or are we involving the entire visual effects pipeline? 
So let's go like, you know, the Avatars and the Star Wars and the high level Marvels, you know, all the all the big, big titles. They're yeah. throwing a lot of Infinity War. You work on that. There you go. <laughs> Just that briefly. One. Right. Um, so we you know, in yeah. those kinds of categories, you're dealing with a full visual effects pipeline. So you're you're starting from, yeah. you know, all the way at the early stages of pre-production where they're coming up with concepts, styles, looks, uh, character designs, you know, all the all the stuff that goes into it working through production to post-production and post-production is a full visual effects pipeline at that point. You're using full on VFX studios with all of their different job categories that could range from, you know, the beginning of concept art to 3d modeling, to rigging, to animation, to, uh, texture, lighting, uh, effects, and then compositing is the last stage in the VFX pipeline typically. Um, if you don't count the VFX editorial, okay. of course, but, um, yeah. so we're the ones that would handle, we'd take all of that stuff that was given to us from all those different stages, typically the final rendered elements. And then we'll also be pulling in the background plates, the images that were shot on camera, whether that be, you know, when they were on set, the actor was against a green screen. The actor was on an actual physical location doing whatever it is they're doing. And then we're integrating all those, the VFX pipeline elements into that live action. But then the inverse, talking about the going back to the budget, let's imagine for a moment it's more of a an episodic television show that is, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, like a comedy show. It's nothing too extensive. They aren't, you know, they're not asking us to create the next Incredible Hulk exploding through a wall. It's a shame. Right? That would be the comedy show I would watch. I'd watch Friends if they had that. <laughs> I want some left field content. But yeah, so like... With that idea, you know, it's just literally just cell phone screen inserts, you know, the, the actors doing this on yeah. their cell phone, swiping, 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 maybe the camera's over the shoulder or something. So you see the screen, but it's black or it's green. It's a green, literally a green screen. We would be the ones that would track it in. We might have um, a motion graphics artist that might design the graphical interface or the elements that might go into that, composite that in and, you know, get it all blended to look like it actually is part of the scene. So that's a very extreme polar opposite, where in that case, it's just the compositor. Then you have some of the mid-level, you know, episodic television stuff. Let's imagine it's a television show about firefighters, just making up a scenario. There might be an opportunity where there's a there's a, a sequence or a, or a set of shots that is the firefighters spraying water on in real life when they're shooting the footage on a building that isn't actually on fire. So then we, the compositors, would go in, we would use stock footage. Spray fire on that building. Exactly. And so instead of us going through the entire uh, entire visual effects pipeline, uh, we might, for example, we might use an effects artist to create effects elements, or we might just use library stock footage, pre-rendered or pre-shot. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, is there like a typical stock thing that you guys can pull from, especially I'm assuming maybe there's like a public facing one, or is there one that like studios will purchase the rights to some of them? Both, both. It depends, you know, depending on the size of the studio, they might just pull from a general library they purchased from a company. There are companies that specialize in creating library effects. Um, we call them library effects because it's just literally like you go to the library and you pick the subject and sense. you know <laughs> why complicate it <laughs> yeah yeah i need i need a hundred fire um, elements that i can then adjust amalgamate and integrate into making it look like giant fireballs exploding out of windows um so and all that stuff is done by the compositor and when you're doing these composited things typically what programs are you using is there like uh like the main three or one that you're just working with or the main premier software that we use now is called nuke it's by the foundry yeah um that's that's the that's the main one there's there's a few others out there that are available but they're not uh they're not the one that most of the studios go after you want to go historical uh i mean for example fusion fusion's been around for a while um, that's, that's another one, but not as many, not nearly as many studios use it at the moment. You can extend back. You want to go historical prior to nuke. The mainstream was shake. Uh, that was, that I was, remember that. Yeah. I remember shake. Yeah. It's yeah. node based, node based compositing. You know, a lot of these programs out there these days, like you can scratch the surface and you can create content, but they have a lot of uh, like a really like deep catalog of tools inside of them. Uh, is, is Nuke something that takes a, a lot to master or is it pretty much like once you get it, you're not necessarily mastering the tools, you're mastering 
the actual creative process of doing um, compositing? A combination of both. You do have to learn how things function, but every every compositor has a different approach when it comes to building shots. It's actually a unique process because since it's no, it's called node based compositing. Every you can imagine it's it's almost like building a house. You know where you have hammers, you have nails, you have wood. You have all the elements that you're needing, but then how are you going to utilize those elements in what sequence of events so that you can build that structure? So taking that analogy into compositing, we have, you know, there are different tools that do different things. So an easy one, let's say there is a tool called the blur node. It literally just blurs whatever is being pushed through it. That's it. You'll have another node that is called a color correct node. It has multiple functionalities to color correct whatever is passing through it. But all of these things, depending on how you connect them, it's an order of operations thing. So step one, step two, step three, on down to the final image that you would see that you would be what we call rendering out to be able to provide for whatever the show or the movie is that is coming out. So all these things that we integrate in node-based compositing, depending on how we set that up, Every person's approach is different. There's standardized practices, but everybody has slightly different ways of doing it. So it's an interesting experience because when you open up a different compositor's, uh, nuke, we call them nuke scripts, it's going to be different yeah. than what you yourself might do. It, and there's a certain high level experience where you, if you know what the nodes do, you know, for example, there's color correction or color correction. There's color. Hopefully based. they label their files too, like the inside of it. Exactly. It's a signature. It's actually the best way to say is it's just like a person's signature, right? Everybody signs their name differently. Same thing in, yeah. in, in your actual script when you open it up. It's, it's a fascinating experience because you actually get to see kind of how each person's brain yeah. itemizes things. That said, there are standardized practices. There are certain ways of doing things that everybody should know. And to answer your question, learning the tools gets you only so far. Learning how to apply those tools. Everybody has a different way of going about it. So to be honest, you never stop learning as a compositor. Yeah. You just continue to learn new techniques based upon many tools that you might have already known. You just didn't know how to connect them in certain ways to get that new result that you just learned. Hey everyone, quick shout out to CG Spectrum for helping make this podcast happen. CG Spectrum is an online animation, VFX, digital painting, and game development school that prepares you for a career in film and games. Whether you're just starting out or you're upgrading your skills, get personalized career training and mentorship from industry pros who have worked on blockbuster films and best-selling games. Courses are 100% online and you can choose from one-on-one -on -one private mentorship options or group classes with just four students max. You'll also get access to career support services and join an awesome community full of like-minded creatives just like you. Learn more at cgspectrum.com. We're bringing the industry to you. Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's like um, there's there's two uh, uh, material and texturing softwares that are kind of um, prominent right now. Mari, mm -hmm. which is also Foundry, correct? Mm -hmm. I believe so, so yes. Sure. Actually, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Substance Painter. And traditionally, like, Substance Painter has always been very easy to get into, hard to master. And then the opposite is for Mari. It's hard to get into, but once you get through it, then it becomes easy. So it's like the, the curves are kind of different in that capacity. And when you talk about like node-based content, which is interesting, because that makes me think of Substance Designer, but also the back end of like, un so I, I work in games, so it makes me think of like how I do blueprint content with Unreal. Okay. And I know they did that for Houdini as well, but a lot of the terms that you're talking about, uh, I'm like, oh man, like if I'm someone who maybe has no clue on how to do compositing, is there another program like, you know, Photoshop or like After Effects or something that I should kind of dabble with before even getting inside there? It's a good question. Um, so some people actually start out the way, the, actually just in general answer, I, I a lot of times define uh, compositing as sort of like, if you know, if you take Photoshop and that's still frame, that's a single image. Now multiply that by at minimum 24 images per second, a moving image or a sequence. Um, and that's what compositing is. So you're doing a lot of what Photoshop is, but just in motion and movement. So is there, is there a big difference between, you know, this is just me being completely naive. Is there a big difference between that and After Effects? 
So, and that's actually the second half that I was going to say. So After Effects is, is originally it was meant as a motion graphics package. It has turned into a compositing package to a certain extent, but it is co what's considered layer-based compositing. So literally you're stacking layers one on top of each other, just like in Photoshop. So when you have those layers, you can turn off layers visually. There are certain assumptions made. You can add effects uh, to it. You can do different uh, things, but there's a lot that happens behind the scenes in After Effects that the user isn't necessarily aware of. Well, the two comparisons, just to, to state it out loud, layer-based compositing is After Effects. Node-based compositing is something like Nuke. Where and node-based gives you more flexibility and more depth and breadth. Exactly. You can control. I'm so smart. Everything. See, look at how great of a teacher he is. Like he's already uh. two more days, and we're going to have you comping shots. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, watch out. I'm going to take Bridgerton season twelve. Um, <laughs> now, virtual production. You know, again, I'm deep in that world, and I feel like I'm curious to see how is 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 that going to make your job easier in any capacity because the ability to have like these amazing sets that are painted in the background or is it you know it, there's it's it's a loaded question <laughs> <laughs> it's a loaded question but no no actually that's a, it's a fantastic question because that virtual production vp is is a, is a huge amount of what the future of our world's going to be quite frankly it's an, a constantly evolving machine like at the moment there's no solid answer to say this is how we're going to define the expectations different studios are still trying to figure out how does that all integrate into the more traditional visual effects pipeline but the simple fact of the matter is as far as i'm concerned based upon what observations of other folks that i've talked to what i've seen already happening virtual production is only going to serve to enhance what it is we do as a compositor yeah um you yeah. know some people might say oh well the, the age of the green screen is over because virtual production in some ways is like green screen 2.0. I know there's more to it than that. So don't think I'm just, you know, pigeonholing it into one corner. For example, green screening, you, you mentioned it, green screening, that's been around for a long time. You know, some people hear green, blue screen, green screen, depending on your, what you're wearing. The clothing I'm wearing would not work for green screen or blue screen. I got blue. Yeah, me yeah, and you yeah. decided to choose plaid final today, so that's good. Absolutely. This, purpose, this is a compositor's nightmare. There's a significant amount of added opportunity that comes out of virtual production because now you get this absolutely amazing dynamic onset lighting that comes out of that. You get actual backgrounds that legitimately feel like they're in the world that they're in. You don't have to green screen. So then the argument might be presented, well, then does that mean a compositor's job might disappear? Um, which the answer is absolutely not. The compositor's job is just evolving, just like all of our jobs in this industry are. We'll still be extracting actors and elements from green screens, blue screens, but in the world that virtual production brings, what that does is it sort of allows us to get reference points already built into our scenes. We already know what the expectation is, but there's still a significant amount of work that comes into play on the back end in post-production for compositing. For example, just even down to fixing screen artifacting that happens on, on set on those gigantic screens, there's issues that come out of that. Um, on over to all the other plethora of elements that a compositor would be handling. As far as I'm concerned, virtual production to me is just this absolutely incredible uh, uh, technology that's coming into play that will in some ways make our jobs easier, but also serve to make brand new unexpected challenges for compositors. Oh yeah. And especially since they just had like the state of unreal address and they show off all these tools and you're like, Oh, what do we can do. And obviously whenever you see all these new tools, there's going to be people who are using it and trying to break it, finding out new things. And then even like with virtual production, it's beautiful because you're kind of blending virtual content and, and real life sets. You're still going to need green screen on some capacity of these things. Yeah. And you're still going to have to do that stuff out. But it sounds like it's going to make things a little easier, but also create more work. Yeah. And kind of like speaking on that, has there ever been like a, a scenario on one of your projects where you 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 did so much compositing and it was like for like a second's worth of work? And you're like, I did it, but it took like six months. Or what, 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 what's the expansion of work compared to like, you know, I worked a month and I got a second done. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that there sometimes, you know, what we say are some of the best visual effects are the ones that no one knows are there. Uh, the, the biggest reward is going to the theater, somebody watching it, and not once do you hear the, an audience member lean over and be like, wow, that looks so fake. Like Polar Express? 
I'm gonna keep my mouth closed. <laughs> no, that was that was that was a great right. movie, but like it's you know the tech comes out. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. Same same yeah. same with like games when you're 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 working on something, and if the person is just complaining about like a character's personality and not the visuals, I'm like, oh thank God. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't me. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the acting was terrible, but man, it looked really pretty. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know, and that, and to that point, it's just it's just a it's just an interesting world because the the expected outcomes of that really comes down to the fact that you know, as you said, like one second of footage could quite literally be multiple months of R and D. Really? You know, it, it. Do you have an example of something you worked on? Oh man. Or is it gonna make um, you cry because it's a bad memory? <laughs> might need therapy after. No. Um trying to think. I'll give a general example. I can't state the movie title, unfortunately. And we're a lot of what we do is bound by the NDA, so that's the non disclosure agreement. Yeah. So so in general terms, you know, I worked on a feature many, many years ago. Uh and we we had an entire sequence that involved uh a number of computer generated characters. It was absolutely an amazing, amazing outcome. And when that, when that was finished, uh, we completed it. It was, it was approved by the director and it went through editorial. And then we went to see the movie and we found about two thirds of everything that we had done in that sequence didn't make it into the final cut in the theater. It was a, oh. it was a massive financial and time investment. Financial equals time and yeah, talent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so time and resources, I should say. So it, it, it you and know, then it always you, comes down to the editor being like, nope. Yeah. Hopefully it made yeah. the bonus footage. Yeah. You, you mentioned superhero stuff and your very first movie that you worked on was a movie that I, I like really, really liked the uh, ghost Rider. Oh yes. Yes. That was my first major feature. Now you did a bunch of stuff after that. Like you went on, went to rhythm cues. You got like the, uh, visual effects Oscar for golden compass. How was that? It was pretty cool. Our our entire team at Rhythm and Hughes got to got to hold the Oscar, which was pretty neat. All of us got our own little picture taken, etc. But yeah, it was pretty neat. Pretty neat experience. I see that you 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 kind of uh, you went to school early on. Where where did you start off at school? I see that you did your masters with uh, for visual effects with SCAD. But what did you do before? Uh, my undergraduate degree was in three D character animation at a university in Tennessee. Uh, it's the Southern Adventist University uh, School of Visual Art and Design. So that's that's where where I landed. Actually, that's where I met a lot of some some very long standing old friends of mine that I've worked with all through the years here in the industry. Yeah, that's that's where I started. I was going to be a character animator, and then I realized very quickly that uh, that wasn't that wasn't quite what I wanted to be. I just didn't know at the time, especially you know twenty one, twenty two, twenty three years ago. Actually, when I first started thinking about yeah. it. I didn't even know what this industry had to offer. I mean, when I was in high school, yeah. I thought I was I was going to go into engineering. I was taking engineering classes. I've been accepted to a premier engineering school. There's a long story behind that, but I ended up getting recruited and ended up uh, landing at this other school, going into animation. And once I realized that there was all these other there were all these other careers that could be found in in this vision in the visual effects slash animation pipeline, uh, that's why I. I finished out the undergraduate degree. I went on to get my master's degree in visual effects, at, as you mentioned, at SCAD specifically, because I wanted to further explore kind of what yeah. what my career meant and then ultimately what was going to be my specialty, because I knew there were specialties and I knew I had to be amazing, you know, not amazing, but I had to be competitive enough at a certain point yeah. to be able to go after the job. Good for you, man. I, I still, I'm still trying to get my master's at some point. Every single time I'm like, ah, <laughs> No, so that, that, that's really cool. I mean, you bring up a good point too. And I think that's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of listeners, especially people at CG Spectrum. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's things that we can kind of talk about, especially of like why people should get in compositing and how, why it's such a high demand. But it's also this thing of like you talked about earlier, like not that many people are aware of what compositing is. And then you yourself wasn't aware when you were in college. And it's one of those things that you kind of discover. And Absolutely. oftentimes we discover things later than we want to at times. So I think the goal, uh, correct me if I'm wrong with you, what you're trying to do with the program here is to, to make it more approachable and discoverable sooner. So that way, you know, you're kind of like taking the things that you learned along the way. And um, like, I guess, like what, what kind of tips would you recommend for people to get into compositing and why they should be doing it? Because I think a lot of the people are listening to this. It's kind of like, you know, it feels... <laughs> 
I feel like when I'm talking to students or hobbyists or people who are younger in the industry, like I feel like I got, hey, there's keywords like first production, technical art, compositing, and you're like, well, I want to be a character artist. So that's great. No one says you can't, but here's this that you can do that's going to- Check out the menu before you demand, decide right? what yeah. food you're going to eat, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's that's the catch. I mean, it, it is a tough thing because- compositing as, as we were saying earlier it's it's somewhat mysterious because people don't realize it exists because it's not a generalized term but the fact of the matter is we are quite literally one of the most in demand uh jobs in our industry there's there's more jobs yeah, everyone in demand <laughs> right there's more jobs for compositors than there are compositors at the moment and it's the advent of streaming media it has exploded and so there is so much out there it's it's a great opportunity to consider but the fact of the matter is it is it is hard to un, to best understand and come into it because we're so saturated with media, but we're also saturated with certain careers and knowledge of careers that come into play. You know, people know what a modeler is these days. People know what uh, they might know what a rigger is. Even they know a lot of the CG process because that applies to a lot of things and there's a lot of publicity that surrounds it. But on the back end of it, it's it's a lot less uh, known. So yeah. yeah, how do you crack that nut? I feel like a lot of people who are uh, students or even junior artists and whatnot, they may be drawn to what visual effects and CG stuff is, but they're like, well, I can't draw. I can't, I'm, I'm not fast at 3D. And, I and then they, they completely toss the idea of working in this industry out of door because right. they're not as fast or good at one scenario, uh, or sorry, Absolutely. one role. The reality is that maybe you'd be good at compositing because you're taking these pieces that other people are creating, but you're still, you have to be able to put them together aesthetically and also functionally. It's kind of like when people would, when I'd be working with them and they'd be like, well, I'm going to be an environment artist, but they wouldn't have this, the speed or the necessary quality level. And I'm like, well, why don't you try being a set designer or a level designer? And then they right. transition like, oh, I really enjoy this. It's like, if someone wants to get into this, in this field, obviously like we have some great programs at CT Spectrum that can help them. Um, but I think or off the bat, a lot of the stuff you just said, it literally is compositing content. And right. uh, I, I, I think there is this creative ability that people kind of have to, uh, I guess the word is get over it. <laughs> because even with like Unreal, like we're, we're introducing, you know, tools like Sketchfab or introducing tools like Quixel Mega Bridge and stuff. The idea is mm -hmm. to be able to quickly create content. And exactly. yeah, we know that you could go back and model content, but if you're a compositor, and, and you're, there's a huge stack of work and someone needs to do all this stuff. You don't have to feel like, well, I needed to create that as well as composite. It's like, no, let people fit to the roles. And I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping some people are listening, like are getting a little bit excited about uh, compositing because, you know, there's a lot to go over. But to kind of Absolutely. get even more excited, you know, I, I know that you're working on something internally right now with us uh, at CG Spectrum for a commercial that we're working on. You want to kind of give us a high level overview on that one? Totally. So uh, we kind of came together, meeting the minds uh, a little bit back, and we're saying, "Hey, you know, we teach this. We teach this stuff. We are the resident experts in this school. So why don't we? If we already have technically an established pipeline to a certain extent, why don't we put all of us into the roles of what a VFX studio might be and uh, create a commercial, so to speak? Put our money where our mouth is and show what we're capable of um, to help." people better understand what it is we do, but also to be able to kind of, as, as you mentioned, peel back those layers and reveal some of that mystery that that's underneath, because the reality is a lot of what we do in studios, we can't talk about, we're, we're yeah. under contract, we're under NDA. So it's, it's a lot harder to be able to verbally convey certain things to people. Um, and with that in mind, uh, this commercial was centered around the idea that we wanted to be able to illustrate exactly what it is people might learn if they were to uh, go into these programs, because we don't we don't want to waste anybody's time. We're here to we're here to teach them to become a specialist in that specific career path that they've chosen. And you mentioned it earlier, just a quick circle back was that, you know, we're our 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 world in compositing, for example. I don't have to draw. I don't draw. I can do technical drawings. But if you ask me to draw a character, there's no way on earth I would ever successfully complete anything past a stick figure. Yeah. My, my five year old does better at that at this point. Um, but 
the reality is I'm very technical, but I'm also very creative. A lot of compositors, we always jokingly say we're on the, we're sort of in the middle, you know, it depends on which side of the bed we get out on and yeah. which side of the bed means whether I'm going to be left brain today or right brain tomorrow. And part yeah. of what we're doing here in this commercial is to, to kind of hit those approaches, not only in all the different categories, but also here in compositing to be able to illustrate those very points. There's, there's something to, there, there's a bit of freedom that comes in when you get the pieces and you have general idea and you can kind of put it together. Cause like you said before, a lot of people who will hand over their nuke files, they each kind of have their own like signature on it. Like they're, they're putting it mm -hmm. together their own way. And it's kind of like interesting to open up someone's file and be like, Oh, that's how you did it. I would have done like this. Oh, okay. So, so the, the core thing was to, to really show the audience, Hey, we're Absolutely. a VFX school on top of it. Like, you know, the nice thing about CD spectrum is, of our mentors are actually in the industry right now too, which is you're like, but you're like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to make something showing that like, we work together. And, and like you just said, those of you who are listening, an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. If you get a job at a studio, which you will, they make you sign these and please read the fine print because you just can't, you can't go sharing things. You can't say things. I've worked with people before who are like working on stuff and they were sharing it on like forums. I was like, why are you doing that? They got in trouble with legal. But, uh, but now because you are controlling the idea and the whole pipeline process and the content in general, um, we can showcase the making of it as well as the final product. And um, that's going to be really, really fun for everyone to see. Who's, whose idea was the sandworm? Just a big <laughs> Doom fan? Jeremy Chin and I kind of were going back and forth on spitballing ideas. We, we went through a lot of different ideas and iterations uh, leading up to that. There were other, there were a number of other people. We had a lot of people kind of offering input and ideas. We, we eventually just centered around the fact that we knew Dune was, uh, when we were talking, Dune had just come out. Um, yeah. And yeah, big Dune fan. And they're doing they're a capable. sequel and everyone loves a sandworm from Beetlejuice and people just like worms. Absolutely. And, and let's be honest, if you're into any kind of sci-fi, I hope everybody has watched Tremors at least twice. Um, right? I wasn't talking about the sequels, I'm talking about the original. It's Kevin Bacon and Fred were at their best. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I, no. I, I love that. Um, but yeah, so with that in mind, you know, it was just, we kind of centered in around that idea and that concept. And we said, hey, you know, we got this idea. Why not have this, this world that we build? Uh, we shot it on set. We went out out into the desert, the high desert out here, uh, north of Los Angeles, to shoot it. I had our own little uh, 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 actual uh, film crew that, that shot this. Then we took that obviously onto you know online it, and then had to build out obviously set up our own virtual pipeline for this, which was kind of a mission critical aspect since we are global here at CG Spectrum, so we're not. We're not everybody in the same office. We're all in the same virtual office, I guess, but uh, different time zones, different yeah. different locations, different upload speeds. In some ways, what we're doing is very similar to a lot of the low to low mid level size studios, you know, to a certain extent, you know, remote remote work has become the mainstream in the last few years now, and it's fairly consistent. So setting up that kind of pipeline, it comes down to even down to you know, file naming conventions. How do you how do you name things so everybody on the team can easily identify what is what? You know, mm -hmm. how are you going to group things into folder structures? Make sure it's all you know readable when you pass it off from one software package to the next. What does that mean? How are we going to find it? Uh, identifying all that and coming back to the fact that you know, in a pipeline such as what we're doing, it's not that far fetched from what it is that can happen in a studio to a certain extent. So uh, how long did this take? And I guess how many people and how long did this take? Oh man, well, you know, we kind of can break it up into two categories. Well, technically three, if we're gonna go traditional production. So we had pre-production, which was just those of us coming together, getting in, you know, spitballing ideas, putting pen to paper, you know, coming up with dialogue that went into it for the script, all those aspects, planning all that out. Then we had production. And so in that category, that was everybody that was involved on set. That was our actor. That was our film crew, uh, the director who directed the, the shoot, uh, on, you know, the, the DP, director of photography, uh, lighting, uh, gaffers. You know, we, we, we had the whole, the whole set. So that was, our team was maybe about a dozen or so on set, give or take. Uh, and then we move into post-production, which is once we take the footage off the camera, we edit it out and uh, prepare the shots so we're ready to actually work on it in the effects world. Uh, then at that point, 
Oh, goodness. I would say probably about a dozen or so teammates without actually checking the list and counting, counting them explicitly. It's probably about a dozen or so uh, individuals working on this at, at various points in the process. That's wild. So, and then how long do you think that took overall? Like, I know you guys all have full-time and part-time jobs and everything and families. So are you talking about literal time when we started it and when we're going to finish, or are you thinking yeah, if like, we were like, to put like, it all together and work full time on it? Yeah, Put it, put it all together, work full time. Like how many hours do you think it would have like, no, like take the hours and make it into like a high ball thing. Ooh. This is, we're talking about a month's worth of work, two months, three months. I would give it a month, solid month. month's worth of work at least. Um, with the, with the, with the same in. crew of like a dozen people, a month worth of work, working like typical. Yeah. If, if we were going like a typical VFX pipeline, the post-production would probably be about, about three to four weeks, okay. give or take. But that would be spaced out longer than those three to four weeks because, for example, post-production, for example, you, you mentioned the worm. The worm design needed to start prior to us even doing on-set shoots. So we had an idea, even though they didn't exist there. How does that work, you know? Yeah. And then working that in also the the pre-production, the planning out, you know, going back to that pipeline setup, part of that challenge was figuring out at what stages are the different software gonna be integrated. We used and are using Unreal to build uh, a large portion of our environment and also render out our worm. So the worm was animated outside of Unreal, but it was brought into Unreal for, for quick render times because we can iterate a lot quicker. And by iteration, I mean multiple versions yeah. so we can, render it see and i know you know this but just for the audience you know to be able to see quick quick turnarounds so um that's on how did that yeah <laughs> but um <psh. laughs> going back to the time-based aspect it was probably a solid month of just post-production all in two to two and a half months probably if we were to add up every single detail that went into it nice um from start to finish yeah very cool well, thank you for taking the time to kind of like talk to us. I mean, it kind of just zoomed through. So let's do another one where we can dig more into like some fun compositing stuff and maybe even bring some other people from uh, like your compositing crew in. We can talk about totally. things and stuff. But uh, in the meantime, where, where can we find you? Like, uh, I, I, we can find you at CG Spectrum, that's for sure. Uh, I'm the head of the department, but I'm all, I am also do teach. I, I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably my connection of choice if people want to find me they can connect on there and we can have a chat if ever they want to thank you again for like giving us the extra time and talking us through what you do and giving us that knowledge jump on compositing and we hope to hear from you soon totally take care have a wonderful day everybody thanks for listening to the cg spectrum podcast for more on this episode visit us at cgspectrum.com forward slash podcast Check out our show notes where you'll find links to our guests and more behind the scenes. And if you're enjoying the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you're listening or share this episode with someone who might like it. See you next time.